going on here, but I think it's all fine. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba. Um, yeah, I mean, if we could be finished by 11, that would be good. So 11. Now it's it must be nine o'clock at your at your place. Yeah, it's nine ten. Super, super. Jonathan, it's good to see you. Where are you currently? I am in uh, Manhattan, on the island of Manhattan in New York City. This is a great place. I would love to go there. How is life in Manhattan these days? It's, uh, you know, surprisingly back to normal. So, you know, the, uh, it seems that uh, uh, everyone's uh, out, hard to get a restaurant reservation. It's, 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 and, uh, really? The arts are coming back. And so... Um, Yeah, so I, I, I was not, uh, I had evacuated to the mountains in North Carolina for the pandemic, but uh, I was not that excited about coming back. But now it seems that uh, it's kind of the, 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 you know, the feeling in New York is kind of back. Well, what do you like more? Do you like more the life in the city or the life in the mountains? What, what's, uh... You know, I like everything that's not in the middle, you know. <laughs> uh, so, if, you know, it's not the suburbs. I, I, like, uh, I like being in like... Um, You know, in the mountain, you know, deep in the mountains where I mostly see bears and wild turkeys or, uh, or, or, or in Manhattan, uh, you know, uh, uh, where there's just turkeys. I'm, I'm, I'm going to San Diego next week. I mean, it's also the United States, but it's on the other side. So it's uh, pretty exciting to have, have you here. You are currently in Manhattan in New York. What was the reason why you decided to, to go to move to New York? Well, I, I was I had moved from working for the government at the NIH to Princeton and uh, had and was working for them for Johnson and Johnson in in New Jersey. And then um, my uh, wife got a professorship at Columbia, and um, I was a little bored at Chain J at that moment, so I uh, uh, decided I would take a job at Pfizer um, in the head, corporate headquarters here in New York and. It made you know, and and I I I think though also I I I you know to me uh, you know living in New York was always a goal you know just mm -hmm. I, I like the culture. What do you like the most um, living in New York? I like um, I like the 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 uh, the energy the the sort of. Uh, Uh, you know, the, the sort of a, uh, you know, people from everywhere that come there that kind of want to, you know, do something that's, that's interesting or, or, you know, kind of are talented mm -hmm. people. And, um, and, and I, I like that, you know, there's a lot of uh, cultural opportunities and just interesting things. There's always sort of a, you know, some random interesting thing that will happen to you if you spend time here. I believe that uh, New York is a, Big, big city from, from my point of view. I live in Vienna. It's uh, two million inhabitants. And I think New York is about 15 million, if I remember right. Uh, oh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, Jonathan, let's jump into the topic of, uh, of this podcast. Um, about, I think, six to 12 months ago, I read a couple of uh, posts and articles on LinkedIn from Christian Angermeyer. And yeah. uh, uh, one, one stood out and uh, he, he said... Uh, 100% of the, of the world's population has mental health issues and we need to do something against it. And he's advocating... 100%? 100%. He's going for 100%. He says, everybody oh. needs support. Okay. All right. And his solution is psychedelic drugs. And um, I read a couple of his posts and he just pops them up frequently. And one day, I think it was last year in October, I read an article about um, Jonathan Sporn a former Harvard and NH scientist uh, who is returning to the psychedelics field with a new biotech after selling his last efforts to the Buzzy Atai Life Science, which happens to be funded by Christian Angermeyer. And I'm really happy that you are here today in this podcast, in this episode, so that I can ask you some questions. Uh, let's start with this uh, mental health problems in society and 100%. What's your opinion? How, how, how challenging is mental health these days for our society? Well... Obviously, 100% is hyperbole, and I'm sure, you know, Christian knew that, but um, I don't really think that I need to convince you or your audience that, you know, the world right now has, uh, you know, significant mental health, you know, challenges, and you can see that 
I think through so many lenses right now, you know, so um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, number of people that have um, anxiety disorders has increased um, mood disorder, uh, mm -hmm. suicide rates are very, very high and have increased over the years. Um, uh, you know, addiction issues have, have also, I think, were high and spiked, I think, further since, uh, I'm not really following the exact epidemiology, but I, I think that it's, even if you just read the newspaper, you, 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 you'd be uh, pretty well, uh, uh, you, you know, and accepting that this is a, a major problem, um, pretty much worldwide. And, and um, you know, and I think we're, I'm, I'm guessing that we're seeing also that even though the, the pandemic now has, you know, abated somewhat, um, that the world is still sort of, uh, um, you know, the, the sort of after effects, you know, or the, the aftershocks of it are still, you know, I think affecting people psychologically and, you know, um, as you know, in the U.S., there's this tremendous uh, violence problem with guns and, um, and you know, a lot of tragic things going on that, you know, are likely, at least in part, um, you know, mental health uh, related. Yeah, I read about it in the newspaper. It's, uh, it's a very sad story about the latest shooting in the United States. Yeah, it's happening every day. Oh, it's really that often? Just get some, some news here? Pretty much. Like, it's, it's literally... Uh, I don't remember how many, but it's there's been already like uh, you know over a hundred of these things in this year. Something like that. Well, what's your opinion? Why is there such a spike? What what are, what are the root causes of these problems? I you know and 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 uh, you know I I I, I think it, it's always a, a, a risk people that are not experts in. Uh, in a particular, you know, in, 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 you know, or experts in one thing, but, you know, sort of beginning to be, to be uh, asked to be experts in, in, in everything. But um, uh, I, I think that uh, the, I, I mean, in the U.S., you have mental health problems and you have mental health problems everywhere, um, you know, and um, I think in the U.S., you just obviously have that, mixture of mental health problems plus this you know very very easy availability of lethal weapons um, that I, I'm sure in Vienna is not the case um, and so I think um, you know so so I, I don't have a feel for what the mental health situation is in in Europe but I think that uh, you know the violence issue in the U.S. is sort of driven in part by that you know, by we weapons, but I, I, I think it's also sort of the, in, in general, the mental health issue is, is, is also, uh, uh, you know, predicated on the fact that people are very, uh, have been isolated um, and, um, and left to their own devices. And I think that sort of, you know, kind of connectivity between people um, and connect and sort of social fabric has been torn rather substantially by, you know, the pandemic, but it, you know, in, in the U S it, it wasn't in, it, there, there was a lot, I think that's always been the case that there's, you know, there's been a lot of people that are, uh, you know, I think loneliness, uh, grief, uh, there's, you know, a lot of that, uh, tra tra I think uh, a lot of people have been traumatized. I, I think a lot of the healthcare workers, um, uh, have been like living in like a war zone essentially. Um, so, uh, you know, you put all that together, um, and, you know, add, uh, you know, add in potent opiates, uh, you know, that are, you know, you know, the, as you know, there's a fentanyl uh, um, is now in pretty much um, a lot of illicit drugs that are flowing um, into countries. And, um, you know, so that, 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 so I think that, that there, there's a lot of factors. Yeah, I agree. The pandemic put a lot of stress on people. I mean, I'm not an expert in that, but what is what you get from the news here in Austria? I mean, we don't have uh, we have stricter gun laws than in the United States. Um, but uh, one study I got was that uh, children already, due to the lockdowns and the the, the frequent changes in measures, um, have uh, the, the mental health issues with children are up to 30, 50 percent of all children of all the population here in Austria have mental health issues, basically, um, as an after effect of the pandemic. And I completely agree to what you say. Also, the healthcare workers had a lot of stress to go through and a lot of changes in the last 
um, months. What I was wondering um, um, when I read uh, about you and your company and uh, what you build and how you sold it to Atelier Life Science and what you're building now, um, I mean, mental health is, is not a new problem. And I always thought there are enough solutions on the market already, uh, antidepressants, for example. Uh, what's the situation? Why, why is it necessary to develop something new, in your opinion? Oh, well, uh, Christian, the, the, I, I, I'm old and I started, you know, practicing psychiatry, um, you know, when uh, the, uh, you know, uh, SSRIs um, had, you know, like Prozac, Flock, uh, mm -hmm. had just come on the market. And, you know, back then, this was a really big deal. Uh, because before that, all we had were, were drugs like tricyclic antidepressants which was a little bit like taking a depressed suicidal person and handing them a gun because these drugs were, if you took a, if you took an overdose of them, they were quite deadly. And, um, so it, it, and, and they also had a lot of side effects and they, and their, you know, sort of spectrum of activity was, was fairly limited. So they, they, uh, you know, you, you ended up treating people with, uh, either, underdosing them or if you gave them full dose they had a lot of side effects and so it was really hard to unless you were pretty sick and so the ssris allowed this sort of uh to that allowed a much broader population of people who were uh had mood anxiety uh symptoms obsessive compulsive disorder was another one where we really had no treatments and the ssris at least were partially successful in treating um, uh, obsessions and compulsions, which is, you know, a pretty common disorder in the, in the world. Um, so that was a really big deal back then and um, changed psychiatry uh, substantially. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe as big a deal as the um, antipsychotics in the 1950s uh, being developed, which, you know, de deinstitutionalized a lot of, a lot of uh, people with psychotic disorders. Um, so, but that was, you know, we're talking the 1980s, right? And um, with minor variations on a theme, there really haven't been um, new mechanisms of action for the most part um, uh, that, um, so these are all drugs that are, you know, what you know, what are called monoamine based drugs and, and increasing serotonin or some of these other monoamines. And, and, um, and so nothing techno. So, so this is an area ripe for, you know, sort of, uh, uh, new technologies because, you know, that's what, you know, like, you know, going on 50 years without, uh, a, a new mechanism of action for, um, antidepressants, um, being, uh, uh, developed or, and some of these allied neuropsychiatric disorders. So, um, so, you know, that those, the, the, those drugs are, are effective, but they're, as you know, not effective for, um, a big chunk of the population. And, you know, the psychiatrists then end up with people on 10 different drugs or five different drugs, um, switching from one drug to the other, adding one to the other, um, and, and often people feel stuck on these drugs where they're better maybe in some cases to a certain degree, but they feel like they're not really completely well, uh, but they're also afraid to stop taking them. Um, and, you know, the side effects are, are, are things that are common like uh, sexual dysfunction and some people get weight loss or get restlessness or what's called akathisia from them. So, so there's a host of issues with these drugs uh, in addition to their taking a long time to work. Um, you know, they don't work immediately. Um, so so the, the, there really is a, um, a, a sense that, um, and, and, uh, that they're, they're also sort of band-aids, you know, they, they, and, and people often feel, they don't feel depressed, but they don't necessarily feel fully emotionally there. So that's kind of a, a, maybe a slight blunting of affect uh, with some of these drugs. So I don't mean, uh, you know, there, it, it's easy really to sort of trash these drugs, you know, the existing drugs. Um, but, you know, for some people, they're tremendously effective. Um, and, um, but what I noticed as a psychiatrist was that, 
you know, back when I practiced medicine, which was a while ago, but, you know, I could probably pick up uh, and do that again, given this lack of, of advancement in the field uh, without having to learn very much new. Um, but when I, I, you know, I, I would be, it would be like, great when you'd see those, those people who got tremendously better on the existing drugs, you were, you know, it was very exciting. Um, and, um, but it was, it, it, it almost seemed as if it was the exception where you had that very crisp, like that's the right drug for that person. So there's a tremendous need now, um, you know, given what we've been talking about and, you know, just, just for example, with post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, all these, all the people that have had tra trauma from wars and COVID and uh, early life traumas, what, whatever it is, um, you know, the, the, uh, there, there are behavioral therapies that work to some degree. And then the drugs like the SSRIs are, you know, you can get them approved uh, to some degree, you know, from, from, from doing big trials, but, you know, you have to do very large trials just to see a difference from placebo. So, so, so the, the, the effect, and, and, and now what we're seeing, you know, as an example, um, is that um, the you know, nonprofit group MAPS um, that Rick Doblin runs, you know, has been doing work with um, uh, MDMA, which is a, a very old drug. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, Back to, I think it's probably the, uh, the drug, the, the, the drug was actually first made in like 19, like 15 or something. And so um, long ago. Uh, re really long time ago. And then, uh, you know, uh, there's, you know, all these sort of stories and these things, you know, where it was then, then of course the CIA always gets involved when there's any cool psychotropic thing. So, you know, uh, so they were trying to test it in the, I don't know, 1940s or something as like a truth mm -hmm. series. Uh, and, uh, but it, you know, it took then, uh, the great psychedelic chemist, Alexander Shulgin, you know, then pick this back up in the 1950s, I believe it was, or something like that. And, um, and began to, uh, explore the, the, the potential of MDMA, but that drug MDMA, uh, you know, in the hands of these MAP trials has, you know, demonstrated in post-traumatic stress disorder, remarkable effectiveness and these are also fast drugs that work fast so and the lesson there is first of all that you can get something to work quickly that it's a drug used with psychotherapy so it's not the drug itself alone but it's it's uh um uh it's sort of and mdma is not a classic psychedelic but it's sort of psychedelic like but it's, you know, psychedelic, you know, assisted psychotherapy, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, um, and, and, and it's, it's in the, what we think is happening with these drugs is in, in general, is they open neuroplasticity, which is kind of a vague term for pretty much your brain changing, you know, the sort of the networks of your brain, uh, you know, our brains are always changing all the time. So neuroplasticity is sort of, you know, the rule, but, but these drugs enhance that capacity. For that, for that sort of fluidity and change to occur, so um, so so now you you see in with psychotherapy and MDMA, people with PTSD where a big percentage of them don't meet the diagnosis anymore after treatment, mm -hmm. which is very different than the little improvements we would get with things like SSRIs and and behavioral therapy works too, but it's really hard. Um, I don't know, you know, if you've ever tried psychotherapy, but, you know, it's very hard, you know, people are very, uh, you know, they're, they tend to be in a groove of how they think and, and feel, and it's hard, very hard to get them out of those deep grooves. And so we, so, so these drugs, you know, sort of allow for um, mobile, in this case with MDMA as an example, mobilization of emotion, mobilization of, of connection to other people, which, you know, um, as we were talking about with the pandemic has been, you know, rather um, uh, diminished. And so these drugs sort of allow people almost immediate access to connectedness and uh, their emotional world um, that then, you know, is sort of a, it's like a catalyst in, an, in a chemistry experiment. It's, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, when, I try to remember my experience with psychedelic drugs. It's mostly the experience from um, articles in the newspaper where um, I read that uh, 
this and that music star tried psychedelic drugs and uh, sometimes had not so so great experiences um is that really such a potent uh um uh, a drug that you can change people immediately as you say um Well, look, I think that, and this goes back to your question about, about my friend Christian Angermeyer and his 100% uh, everybody's mentally ill, um, uh, which does sound like Christian, but he also does have a good sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, I think uh, that, you know, that uh, we're, 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 we don't want to over... Uh, sell the these things. Um, we don't want, you know, the problem with a lot of things is they get hyped to the to 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 the moon, and and that is detrimental. So you know, psychedelic drugs, you know, historically and back to the uh, you know the, the days of the hippies and the the you know of uh, of uh, Kesey and uh, you know. Ram Dass and, uh, and and all of these things, you know. Yeah, I think the, I remember. I think Jim Morrison wrote some songs uh, while he was using psychedelic drugs, and I think also Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, uh, I used that. Oh, the, the, the the Doors. Uh, it, it, the name The Doors is is from uh, Aldous Huxley's book The Doors of Perception mm -hmm. about uh, you know him tripping on mescaline. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, oh, so I think that the, the we don't want to we. That we don't want to. What we want to, I think, portray these drugs as is as uh, as as um, uh, um, sort of uh, you know. It's like uh, you're a scientist, and now you have a microscope. Now you know if you if I give you a microscope, you know, depending on your 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 uh, talent in science, you you may or may not you know uh, uh, make great discoveries, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and depending on who's helping you to teaching you about, you know, cells and, and microscopes, you know, et cetera. So, so the microscope obviously has had, had, you know, uh, you know, it was sort of like the telescope for astronomy, you know, and, um, and people have sort of uh, suggested that, you know, psychedelics are sort of the equivalent of the microscope or the telescope uh, uh, for psychiatry. That's, that's a, uh... It's a great metaphor. When when did you get the inspiration in your life that, um, I mean, on one hand, you said something needed to change. And on the other hand, you started doing research with psychedelic drugs. What what inspired you? What lit the spark in you to go down that route? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a complicated sort of, you know, as, as you might imagine, you know, uh, meandering tale, but uh, it... it uh, And, and, and Christian Angermeyer gets a little bit of credit there uh, for being a, a great, uh, you know, kind of enthusiast for this whole area. But I, I, I had been, I mean, you know, just uh, for full disclosure, you know, back in my wayward youth, I had, uh, you know, been a, a student at Duke University and I had uh, experienced uh, uh, drinking uh, 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 mushroom tea with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. and And I, I remember it like a, to this day, like a flash, you know, the sort of flash memories that, that, you know, were of something very significant that you, that, that uh, you don't ever forget. And, um, and it, 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 uh, it really sort of opened me to sort of thinking about the mind and thinking about psychology and thinking about human development and kind of, um, more sort of mystical and spiritual sort of topics and, and this sort of thing. And, and I think th then because of that, I, I became a student of this, the, this uh, great mystic philosopher, G.I. Gurdjieff. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, and, and then, and then that, but I, I think in the end, all of that led me to uh, have people who, uh, I interacted with and said, you'd be a good psychiatrist. And, and I, I was like, I would. And, you know, I, I, I and, uh, you know, I was in medical school at the time and wasn't really necessarily obvious to me that, that that was the most interesting thing to do. I mean, psychiatry was sort of, is still sort of a 
field that, you know, where we don't really understand all that much about the organ of interest, you know, the brain. Mm. And um, so I, uh, but, but I, so I think I saw that how these drugs could have such a powerful effect on um, this, on the sort of direction of one's thought and the direction of one's life and kind of being able to sort of, you know, I remember being able to watch myself from above, you know, watch, watching my behavior as if I, as if I was, it was a movie camera and I was being, and I was watching myself on TV. Yeah, this uh, is what this is. This is one of the exercises uh, that people get when they do coaching education. So when they get a uh, training in coaching, that uh, you should get outside of yourself and uh, observe your own behavior. And yeah. with these tracks, it's possible. Yeah, and and so 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 I think there's a lot of self observation that is possible, and that's why it's very important. Um, and you know you you know you you've heard this term. You know you want to take psychedelic drugs, but you want to have to be you want to have a good trip. You know, I want to have a bad trip, right? And although in some ways, I think those, it's a very binary way of thinking about it because some of the things that happen in these sort of psychedelic trips can be difficult uh, or painful in some ways, but it, 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 but it, it can then be in the service of, of looking at and exploring things. Um, and, um, so in any event, I mean, uh, that, that I think is, is, is very important, but I think what happened to me was then I, I, because of all of this, um, I, I remember that I would sit, I, I went to medical school in Miami mm -hmm. and I would sit in the jacuzzi in coconut Grove. And, and, uh, there was this woman, I was dating her daughter and she, but she had, was this sort of famous professor of psychiatry at Harvard. And she had retired down to Miami and we would sit in the jacuzzi. Uh, not with the daughter, strangely, with the mother, and and the mother would give me articles to read in psychiatry, and then we would discuss them. And then she said, "You'd be a good psychiatrist," and she sent me to Boston, which, is, I guess, probably now or at the time anyway, was sort of like the place to go to train. You know, had the had the the most intellectual, you know, kind of atmosphere for psychiatry. Um, so 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 I think that that was sort of like in the. So then you know I went on to do psychiatry and. I ran a department and did research and all these things, but it was in the back of my mind that, uh, you know, this experience. And then I, I got interested in, um, I was, you know, I, I, I was interested in what's kind of referred to as the sort of glutamatergic theory of, of mood disorders, which glutamate is this, uh, um, um, the, sort of the main, Uh, excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. And, um, and I got very interested in that this was an alternative way to look at um, depression. And in fact, psychedelic drugs influence this glutamatergic balance we now suspect. And, um, but at the time it was just more my interest in this. And I, and I, I, and I was very interested in manic depression. I, I was always fascinated by the fact that people could be, you know, go from this tremendous, euphoria and almost superhuman capabilities and then dive into into the most you know bleak suicidal depressions um you know within a short time and then back did you did did you i mean uh, you said that uh it, it, it's it's very interesting to you this area this um this is it bipolar disorder some 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 very have euphoria and then just fall down uh, some sort of rabbit hole and uh, end up in a very dark place What, what's the reason why that happens in people? Do you, what, what's, your, what's your opinion on that? Well, you know, why people have these cyclic, you know, mood disorders, as they're called, um, is, you know, we don't, that, that's part of the problem with a lot of these things is we, 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 we really don't know. Um, we, we know that there are certain things that are extremely helpful uh, to them, for example, lithium. Mm -hmm. um, which again, you know, in psychiatry, sadly, was, you know, dis discovered complete, completely serendipitously and sort of like the logic of it makes no sense, but it doesn't matter. Somebody, you know, Cade and these guys figured it out, you know, but it was really because it sedated rodents, you know, when they were using it as a solvent. So, uh, but, but, uh, but we don't really know uh, the, the, the cause of it, but uh, it's clear that people can go from, You know, when they're hypomanic is when 
you know, say writers and artists that have a predilection often to these things, it's, you know, it's when they're, they're, they're most productive, you know, they, it's when, you know, Tchaikovsky's writing all this great music and et cetera, you know, the, the people have uh, the most remarkable capabilities. And so if you think about it, it's a little bit like, uh, there, there's an analogy there to psychedelic drugs in a way, you know, that the people can be in a state where they, they're, they're able to, where their mental flexibility, their neuroplasticity is enhanced and they're able to learn things and to understand things and to create things um, at an astounding pace. And the problem is then they go from that, what's that, that state, which is called hypomania to full mania. And in full mania, then it becomes a quite uh, dangerous and dysfunctional state where people, you know, are delusional sometimes and um, uh, danger to themselves and destroy things. And it's, you know, quite, uh, uh, and become psychotic and end up in the hospital and it's very dangerous. Um, and then equally so then they crash into these depressions. Um, but we don't, the, the, we really don't know the answer as to why those things occur. So, but, you know, back to your question, I mean, I, I, I so this, I flew, I, so I started to flow into just learning about the glutamate, glutamate system and people were, you know, was a, a, people at the NIH were also very kind and sort of open and like, you know, it was sort of this wor wonderful world where people were like, come into my lab, but let, let, you know, of course, you know, the lab chief picks up the phone and himself and discusses things with you, you know, at the spur of the moment. Uh, so I really, I really liked that. And, and I, I liked the intellectual, it, you know, I was, I was a little, uh, after a while, a little bored with the limitations of just practicing psychiatry. It seemed kind of okay. I, like useful and helpful to me, but sort of not enough. So, so I, 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 I ended up writing a paper on, on a new drug for manic depression uh, called the Motrogene or Lamictal. Um, and, um, and, uh, and then, uh, and then at some point, um, I, my, my, my wife got recruited to the, to the NIH, to the labs at NIH. So I was kind of coming along. At, I had to get a job or they wouldn't accept her because they, you know, they, so I had, I had like cold, cold, cold call everybody at all the lab chiefs at the NIH till I got a job on within 10 days. So I got a job and, uh, and I went there and then I had this tremendous time learning because, you know, money was no object. As long as you had good ideas, it was Friend. fun and it was just fun. And, and I learned a tremendous amount. So, uh, you know, but then I ended up going off to industry to, to Jane Jay and, uh, we're, we're after so I, why, why yeah. let me just interrupt a little bit. Uh, I would like to understand it better. Why did you decide to go to the industry? Um, you were in, the, in a perfect research situation. Yeah, you know what? It, 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 it was partly because it was, it was very, uh, it, the NIH was this tremendously rich research environment, but for doing clinical research, it was quite limited. Um, mm -hmm. You, you know, you, it was just very, uh, it was very slow and difficult to recruit subjects. And um, it was, uh, you know, just, you know, some of the bureaucracies of the government and, and it, 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 it was, I, I felt sort of impatient uh, there and with, with the pace of things and, um, and felt also like the NIH didn't make drugs. They didn't design molecules, you know? So, so you were then dependent on like the pharma companies to partner with you to study something. And so, uh, which we did quite a bit of, but it felt as if like, well, I really want to be involved at the level where we're designing new molecules and making new things and where we have resources to do it quickly. And that was definitely not the NIH, despite how much I learned there and, and how much I liked it. Um, it, it, it was, it was a, a little bureaucratic and slow. So, um, so, and, and, and also I got into a little bit of, of a difficulty where I, I made the mistake of being, I think, too honest. And, and some reporter called me from the New York times and asked me about this, uh, study I had, uh, I had, uh, uh, presented at a meeting and it was a very boring study. It was 
completely negative study. So I, I really wasn't really thinking too much about it, but what I, it ended up in the newspapers because the, I didn't know this, but the drug company, which at that point was Park Davis, was being indicted by the feds uh, for um, illegal marketing of the drug that they asked me about. And so I somehow inadvertently ended up in the middle of this, which was not, nobody was very uh, happy about at the NIH. Uh, and uh, so, but because of that, somebody saw this in the newspapers and said, well, would you like a job at Johnson & Johnson? And is, so, uh, so basically it was good marketing for you <laughs> to, to get in I, the things. wrong thing, but somehow it like ended up, uh, you know, good, good for me. Uh, <laughs> And um, so, so I, I, I thought about it and I was like, huh, Johnson and Johnson, that's kind of, and I went and often interviewed there and, and I, I said, you know, realized I could learn a tremendous amount about drug development from these people because that's you know, the that thing. And, and it was also very, John Chain J was a great place to start. It was like very kind of, I don't know, almost like the 1950s or something. It was just very uh, old fashioned and people, they, they really took care of their employees and it just felt it, it would seem kind of like if you had to go somewhere in industry, it was a good place to start. So I spent a few years there and, um, um, but, but, uh, in which, how, in which, in which area did you work back then at J and J? What, what was it also? Uh, uh, yeah. The, well, I worked for in the psychiatry and the neurology franchises as they called them. So I was, we were developing, I, you know, my first project was a, a no, was a d developing a, uh, a novel antidepressant, which, you know, and this is another reason that I also, you know, for later that one of the lessons I think for me about moving from big pharma to biotech was, and this is an example where we did a big study with this drug and it worked, but it was not, it didn't work as well as, as, Paxil or paroxetine, which is an SSRI. And so they, so Johnson and Johnson and had, there were some side effects, but so Johnson and just Johnson decided to kill the whole program. But, but I had patented, but from the data, I had patented a new use for this drug, uh, for, uh, sleep wake, uh, disorders and, uh, and, and, um, and it, cause it had this like, uh, awakening stimulating property. Um, and so, um, so they, Johnson and Johnson just gave it back to, uh, uh, SK corporation of Korea where they had, they had licensed it from, um, but they took SK corporation, uh, they took that patent that I had filed, um, which they then owned and they made that into, uh, a drug for sleep wake disorders, which is now on the market, uh, uh, and sold by Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and is you know I, I you know it's like a billion dollar uh, drug most likely at some at some point. So so it so it struck me that that was another example where I, I, another learning uh, lesson for me, which was that you know that this sort of like the NIH, this was a you know J and J you know was a, a, a you know a, a large bureaucracy, and um, uh, and. Uh, so the larger uh, the comp, the larger the organizations, the more bureaucracy you get on the table, I guess. Yeah, and, and, and sort of a rigidity in decision making and a lack of sort of creativity. And I was just like, this is terrible. Uh, as much as I also like J and J. Um, and, and I think, by the way, the same thing, there's another, you know, kind of a follow up to that, which was that, you know, later. Well, my, a lot of the people I worked with at NIH, uh, like Husseini Manji and, and such, they all like left NIH and they all came to J and J, but they came as I left, mm -hmm. and um, and they developed esketamine or Spravato, as it's called, which is the first of these you know new rapid acting antidepressants. That, you know the as I kind of said, this glutamatergic antidepressants. This was the first one, first drug approved, and. Um, so that is kind of, in, it was sort of interesting because later when I uh, left uh, uh, Pfizer, I, I, I decided to, that I wanted to develop essentially the mirror image of what J&J &J was doing, or you know, they were developing what's called S-ketamine. And I decided that they, they made 
the wrong call and, and, and our ketamine was actually the better drug for psychiatry, which J and J was not too happy about. What's the difference between these, these two? Well, they're, they're stereo isomers. So, uh, you know, so they're, you know, the, the equivalent of, you know, the, the, of your left hand and your right hand, you know, they're, they're the same, but they're different, right? You know, you, mm -hmm. you, you can't put your, your, your right glove on your left hand, but your hands are the same. So they go to the dark sides, the Jedi and the, uh, what's the other side in the, in the in Star Wars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something like that. So, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, um, the light or the, you know, uh, uh, so, so the, um, the, yeah, so, 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 uh, so I think that's another example where, you know, they, they decided we were developing S-ketamine and that's the answer. And, and, and they surprisingly left on the table what we think is the better mm -hmm. isomer compound to develop for psychiatry. S ketamine is better for anesthesia, I think, uh, uh, where it's used in around the world. Uh, but our ketamine looks like it's the better drug for psychiatry because that different, that stereochemistry creates different physical chemical properties, you know, because drugs are binding in receptors that have three dimensional, uh, you know, uh, uh, configurations. So, um, so, so, so that's another example where, you know, the, 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 there's a problem of, in terms of innovation, um, at these big organizations. And so, so I, I left there and went to Pfizer and, you know, but along the way, then you learn how to run big projects and you learn how to, you know, you learn a tremendous amount from the, these organizations are very, you know, resource rich. Um, and so, um, so I, 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 I left Jane Jay. My wife got a job at uh, professorship at Columbia, so I left there. Left uh, Jane Jay, moved to Pfizer, but uh, it, eventually it was the same sort of story. Where you know Pfizer also, you know, was very bureaucratic and very political, and uh, um, and um, uh, and uh, you know was spending a tremendous amount of money um, and uh, getting. I don't, I didn't think a whole lot out of their research efforts, at least in psychiatry. Um, and, um, and they figured that out finally and decided to leave. It, uh, one more question from my end. Uh, you mentioned yeah, yeah. Pfizer. In these days, Pfizer, Pfizer did, did uh, still uh, allocate large budgets to early stage research. I always, I mean, when I now look on the pharma industry, it looks to me that uh, all these big corporations focus more on marketing drugs and uh, getting the regulatory approval processes done and do the large uh, scale phase three trials, but not the earlier stages. But in these days, uh, Pfizer was also, and J&J &J were also involved in early stage research. Yeah, no, I mean, I think they're always doing early stage research at all these big companies, but they, they're, They, they oftentimes, I think, don't end up being uh, the, the best at, at doing that early stage research. And I think- what, what, what's, what's your opinion? Why, why is that? Why is early stage research better in small companies than big corporations? I, um, I think it's the, I mean, I think if you, you study the culture of a biotech, and then study the culture of a big uh, pharmaceutical company. Um, there's a, um, a passion and a focus and an energy and a um, scrappiness and a, uh, a being able to make decisions. You know, at, at Pfizer, all decisions were political and took forever, you know, and at a biotech, the decision is made because somebody calls me, you know, mm -hmm. and that's it. You know, so the, 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 you know, uh, and, and, and of course most biotechs will fail, uh, but there'll be enough of them to succeed. And when they do, you know, they, they tend to often be, uh, you know, um, quite, so, so it's not entirely the case. I mean, there've been plenty of drugs, of course, being de developed by big companies, but it's often this cultural issue. So if you look at like when the statins first got developed, you know, Merck, um, Uh, 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 developed the first uh, statin, and but at the time, uh, you know, uh, uh, Roy Vagelos could come from from St. Louis, and it, you know, Merck was uh, was 
you know, not doing all that well. And, you know, he kind of pulled up some dejected chemists from the basement and started drawing things on the blackboards and, and had a, a vision, you know, and a passion for like, this is how we're going to create the next drug f- for cardiovascular disorders. Mm-hmm. And, and the science had was ripe for that. And he had, you know, so he brought that excitement and vision and, 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 you know, to, to Merck. Um, and, um, and that, but of course, in the end, Pfizer, you know, then marketed Lipitor, which became even a bigger drug. Um, so um, the, the, the first horse, uh, it doesn't always uh, win, you know, that starts the first horse out of the gate doesn't win the race necessarily. But, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but, but I think, again, that sort of even that in that case, where Merck was a big company, it was that Vagilos coming and creating that excitement and energy and, you know, kind of new, blo- new, new vision and blood and sort of leadership, you know, the kind of, and, and that, that t- t- and, you know, big companies, it just tends to become sort of mechanical and somewhat bureaucratic. And you're always sort of fighting up against the commercial people and the, you know, uh, and, the, you know, they have strategies that they develop that, you know, only allows you to do this and this even though you kind of aware, like it'd be better if you didn't do that, but well, but that doesn't, you know, it, 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 we don't, we're not interested in anything unless it has nine zeros after it, you know, the sort of thing where smaller, smaller companies don't think that way. So I I think that sort of combination of things. I I think there is, um, it's like, um, it's like at the army, you need, sometimes you need troops and sometimes uh, for some tasks, special forces are just better at smaller groups and yeah. um, they're much quicker. And it's, I think it's the same with small biotechs and large pharma. So some tasks, especially at the early stage development is better allocated in small biotechs and because they're faster decision-making processes, more passion, uh, getting things done, um, moving forward. And when I think, for example, at uh, mRNA vaccines, I mean, it's one, one of the recent examples um biontech and pfizer i mean once uh drugs really need to be spun out uh or pushed at scale to patients i think the large pharma troops are the best solution for that I mean, just imagine a small biotech building then sales forces uh would next to be impossible so i think there is a good and good and bad sides in both worlds Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, well, big pharma was, it was in some ways it was great for me because I, you know, first of all, I, I steal all their people and, uh, and also it just really, uh, you know, gave me a background, uh, you know, in, in so many things, it was like a, you know, uh, like a, a, you know, a 10 year training program or something. I mean, you had, you had everything. You had a university background in psychiatry. Then you went to NIH for, for research, doing research, and then uh, the big pharma background. Uh, and then, I mean, from what you were saying, the logical decision then was to found your own company. When did that happen? When did you make the decision the first time that you say, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, start something on my own? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I was the clinical disease uh, area expert in, at Pfizer for you know, neuroscience and, you know, in the psychiatry area. And so I, you know, and I could see things kind of going downhill in terms of Pfizer's interest in psychiatry. And uh, they, they, they weren't, they, they really didn't, you know, put much effort into that. And, um, and, and I, and I realized that they were going to leave neuroscience. So I had to figure out, well, what, what do you want to do next? You know, and, um, And I tend to be a little restless. I don't want to do the same thing. And I, I don't want to do something bureaucratic and repetitive. So, um, and, um, and then I went to a meeting of, of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, the, the ACNP, which is this very elite organization that has a meeting every year. And I, um, and I heard a, a talk, uh, talks on the whole, the, you know, this whole glutamatergic ketamine space, which I had sort of been out of, you know, for many years. And I was trying to make sense of the whole thing. And there was a lot of contradictory data and it was unclear what was going on. And then this guy um, named Kenji Hashimoto from Chiba University, mm-hmm. Japan, gave a talk on our ketamine. And, and, and as I listened to this talk, I was like, I, it sort of came to my mind that this may be, he may be right. And, and, it, and, and nobody seems to be quite 
registering that. And, and I think that's, that's, that, that happens quite a bit too. You know, there's sort of, every, everybody's kind of going down, you know, the orthodox, some orthodox route, you know, and, and then, and, and, and he kind of came with this idea that, and, 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 and also there wasn't a strong understanding of like, well, why, you know, our ketamine is weaker, uh, is, is a, uh, it has weaker binding to its receptor, which is the NMDA receptor. So why would you pick the weaker isomer if you, you know, if you have a choice, you know, why would that be better? That doesn't make any sense. But I sort of realized like we don't really, the NMDA receptor is very complex and it ha has variations across the brain and subunit uh, composition. So it, there was a lot we didn't know. And so it was sort of an empiric, my, my empirical sense was like, this may be right. And so I met with them and, um, and I uh, brought my, uh, my, my, my old boss from Pfizer into the picture, Jake Kranzler, who had a lot of biotech experience. And we sort of negotiated with uh, the university to license our ketamine and that we decided we would, we would develop that as a drug. And, you know, we had a little trouble because of the fact that uh, people were like incredulous because they were like, well, you can't be right because J and J, if you were right, J and J would have been all over this, you know, because they're like this giant company with all of these, you know, intelligence people and thousands of scientists. Like, how how could it be that they're like you just come along, you just as a person and and do this? And so people were not, they didn't really and J and J was also very, you know, very defensive about this because of course if I was right, they would they looked not too great. Uh, um, so, uh, so there was a lot of internal, you know, kind of anger at, from the J and J people at our, my old NIH colleagues who, and, and, and what happened was that there was a, uh, my old colleagues at NIH, uh, Carlos Zarati and company, um, and Todd Gould, uh, they published a paper in nature, uh, that essentially said that, uh, the what's really going on is that there's a metabolite of R ketamine of the R isomer called 2R 6R hydroxynorketamine, mm -hmm. and it's that metabolite that actually is the um, the anti what what causes this antidepressant effect, and so it wasn't clear that they were right, but they replicated this R ketamine data. But the, but the NIH then said, well, we'll license to a company this metabolite because they had patented it. And so all the companies went scurrying off to try to patent, uh, to sort of, to try to license this uh, patented uh, metabolite. And this left our ketamine and the Japanese like sitting there and nobody was interested. So this, so I was able to write them a check and um, you know, for for a very small amount of money, license in the uh, the uh, the compound and start to develop the program, um, and and so um, so so I uh, so this then so this this did they get it right? This was the uh, foundation basically of perception or neuroscience, yeah, so your first right. company, right? And this was you know, in perception, you know, Jim Morrison had the doors as from the doors of perception. I took the the doors of perception perception. <laughs> And, uh, and so, uh, we started, yeah, so I started perception and, um, and perception neuroscience, uh, you know, we start and we started to, to get the trials planned and preclinical work going. Um, and then, uh, as we were doing that, uh, you know, we needed to raise money, uh, and a couple of different folks came along, including Christian Engermeyer. Uh, and who was now enamored with psilocybin and psychedelics and wanted to build like the bridge bio or Roy Vant kind of model of mm -hmm. things. And, and, and he was very, him and George Goldsmith, who runs Compass, they were very intent on doing a deal to, uh, uh, to buy a, a controlling share in, in perception. Uh, and so... Uh, so I negotiated a deal with them, uh, and, uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, perception got funded and, you know, move forward. So that's how that, and, and now it's in phase two, 
uh, development, um, uh, you know, uh, which is, you know, uh, happening in the US and, and Europe. I mean, it's, 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 it's a big success. I mean, given that uh, I would say 99 out of 100 early stage biotech fail and don't move forward. So basically your company moved up to clinical phase two already with, with the compounds. It's really, yeah, congratulations. Uh, it's great right. success. Uh, thanks. No, I, and now, now, now the, uh, we have to, you know, I think, I think it's, uh, you know, there's a very high probability of success for that compound, um, uh, you know, given the data. And uh, I, you know, I think it would be very surprising if it doesn't work. Um, which, which, which indication does a tie focus with your uh, compounds now? It, uh, it's being developed uh, for treatment resistant depression. Uh, mm. so, and I think it could, you know, would be effective for pretty much any kind of depression or, or an anxiety disorder uh, and, and, and substance abuse disorders too. Mm -hmm. so, so it has a pretty broad spectrum of activity and there's That's very, good news. Strong, strong intellectual property. So it, it's, it's a pretty good uh, program. Um, and, um, and, and now, uh, ironically, they brought people from Johnson and Johnson in <laughs> to run it. So the the circle is closed now. So it's basically yeah. Johnson Johnson back. There was, there was back, back to Johnson, <laughs> Johnson who were like screaming at them, like, "Why aren't you, why aren't you talking to Sporn about licensing Arketamine?" And they were like, "Shut up! Don't don't ever." <laughs> That's a, that's a funny part of the story. Let me ask you one question. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, usually here in Austria or in Europe, uh, the dream of uh, scientists who got the entrepreneurial spark, found a company, sell a company, um, and the dream usually ends with uh, they live happily ever after on the islands with 10 Teslas and uh, nice houses and just retire and enjoy life. Uh, you decided to found another company. Why? <laughs> why, why did you uh, say there is something that needs to be done? Christian's right. Mental health problems are 100%. You see, mm. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I, um, I mean, I, I don't see what I do generally as work. So I like, I like, it's just, it's extremely interesting and fun. So like, I, I, I think, you know, I don't know what I would, you know, do on the Island after I drove the Tesla <laughs> around a few times, you know? Uh, so, uh, uh, And so uh, I think that, so what, you know, I mean, honestly, what happened was I, 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 I stayed on at Perception as the chief scientific officer, but it just felt, didn't feel like the right fit for me. I, 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 I you know, unless they were going to really take Perception and make it into a, itself into a larger enterprise, but, you know, it was really a single product company. Um, and so my, the, the best use of my ability wasn't really running, you know, those early stage, you know, projects, um, you know, for that one molecule, um, at that point. So I think I, I, I so I, I didn't stay that long there after that. And then I, I had through, you know, sort of again, back to my Johnson and Johnson roots, one of my close friends was the head of sort of licensing stuff for Johnson and Johnson for neuroscience. And uh, he brought me to his lake house North of New York with an, in, with this young uh, uh, medicinal chemist who, and, 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 and he brought me because the chemist was interested in um, a molecule called tyaneptine, which is an antidepressant in Europe. It doesn't exist in the U S mm -hmm. Um, and, um, it was a Servier molecule and, and he was making new, uh, salts or new, new, uh, or, uh, some new, uh, forms of tyaneptine. And, um, and so, and, 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 they, and this guy knew that at J and J, I had been instrumental in getting J and J to make new salts of tyaneptine and try, had tried to get them to develop it, um, to no avail. They, 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 they started, a, they were going to start a company to do it. And then they lost interest somehow along the way, another big company story. And um, so they brought me to meet him and then we stayed in touch. And then when I realized that I was going to leave perception, I called him up and said, we're starting a company. And, um, and, uh, and he had already also started a company that he also now has sold to a tie to Christian's folks and uh, called Cures with a K. And uh, so I said, we're going to start a company and we're going to do what 
I think is not, was not being done in the psychedelic space, which was to develop to develop novel drugs with IP on the chemical matter um, that were going to really innovate the space as opposed to psilocybin is a great drug. So why don't we develop it even though it's a generic drug or MDMA is a great drug, but it's a generic drug. There's not much innovation there. There's just, you know, pushing things through the system. And then of course, you know, pharma is not interested in those things because they can't protect them for their investment. Um, so, um, so I had this vision that we would take what we both, what we knew scientifically. Also, I realized that these chemists were really into psychedelics. And so they knew every compound that had been made and tried by people anecdotally. So like the great chemist, Sasha Shulgin, who, you know, used to work with the DEA and then they, 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 uh, and then he published, uh, his uh, books, his sort of uh, kind of recipe books on how to make psychedelics and they, uh, you know, parted ways with him. Uh, but uh, he, he had made, you know, changed Adam, Adam, you know, uh, 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 by Adam, these uh, psychedelic drugs and then tried almost tried hundreds of them himself. Um, and so uh, he was sort of the, you know, the, 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 the great sort of father of the psychedelic you know, you know, chemistry area. And so they knew every single molecule that Shasta Shulgin, what he had said about them. And, and also, you know, there's on the web, there's so many people with trip reports reporting on their, you know, all these psychonauts reporting on their experience with psychedelic drugs. So I realized these guys knew everything about this. And, mm -hmm. and, and they were also really good academic, you know, experienced chemists and, and, and Andrew Krugel, my, partner was, you know, very uh, entrepreneurial. So, uh, so I said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take molecules of different kinds and we're going to then look at them and then we're going to say, what could be better? And so as an example, even though our ketamine is this drug and I think is, you know, making great progress, we were like, well, it's good, but if it was a pill, it would be even better. So can we design a molecule that will have you know, we'll, where the properties of, of it will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, commensurate with our ketamine, but it's a new molecule and it's different because it's a pill, uh, because mm -hmm. ketamine you can't uh, really use very readily as a pill because your liver chops it up uh, fast in a, in a variable way. So it's, it, you know, it's the fir first pass metabolism problem. So, uh, so that's an example where we realize like, you know, we, we can likely do that fairly easily. Um, and, um, and, 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 and given you have the right team. So I think uh, it's not, it's uh, not chemistry is not that easy. No, no, right. But, it, but, but uh, for the right chemists with the right ideas, it wasn't that mm -hmm. hard. And, and it was like, it, and, 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 and what was interesting was that in the space, all the people interested in ketamine were mostly clinicians and not chemists. So they were looking at, ketamine, arketamine, metabolites, but they weren't thinking about making new molecules. Um, uh, they didn't know how to do that. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, this is, and this really hadn't caught the attention yet of too much of uh, Big Pharma. And um, Jane Jay was already pot committed with esketamine. Uh, so we realized we could do that. And then we, we just went down the line. We were like, okay, well, Uh, you know, for example, DMT, which is, you know, one of the active components of ayahuasca, you know, which is this, you know, Peruvian, uh, uh, you know, concoction that people make that are, that's very psychedelic, but people vape DMT, but it's very, it only lasts about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Um, and so we thought, well, DMT is a great drug, but it's so fast, it's so short acting. We weren't sure that that was long enough to really be fully therapeutic. And on the other hand, things like psilocybin or LSD last, you know, four, six, eight hours. And that's really hard on, you know, our healthcare system, right? Like how do you, you know, have people sitting around for six hours in your clinic, you know? Uh, so, um, 
So we decided that what we'd like is a molecule that maybe lasted, a, that was like DMT, but lasted about an hour. And, and also DMT has some serotonin releasing properties, which is partly what MDMA does. So mm. it gives you this sort of warm, emotional, connected feeling. So we realized that we could have a molecule that, that was a little bit like psilocybin, but also a little bit like MDMA and lasted about an hour. So we designed a molecule with those properties. Um, and, um, and that, uh, and that's another example where now we, we think that that will, it's a hypothesis that that will have about the right, uh, you know, characteristics, uh, therapeutically for, you know, uh, neuropsychiatric kind of conditions. Um, and, and this, this has sort of been now an iterative process that there's this tremendous amount of this stuff going on in the company. You know, another example is we, we thought, well, you know, people love microdosing, but the problem with microdosing is, you know, you're taking say a 10th or two tenths of a dose of a psych of a full psychedelic dose of say LSD. But the problem is, is that you, know, you don't want to send your grandmother home with a big bottle of LSD and tell her to take one because she might, depending on the grandmother, take more than that. And, um, and so, you know, and then, and that, so, so it's not, it, it has problems as a take home medicine because of the potential uh, for it to be, uh, you know, abused or not adhered to uh, dose wise. So, so did they, they, they understand you right? So the current yeah. uh, treatment regimen is that people go to the clinic and uh, get the dosing then um, under observation of a clinician, of a doctor or a nurse. So it's uh, not for take-home uses what's currently in development and close uh, to market. Right, like MDMA and psilocybin and LSD and all these things are being generally developed for use in a supervised setting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 uh, uh, so, uh, we, what we wanted to do was say like, well, if you could, if you had a microdose, but you knew that people couldn't take, couldn't get a, a whole psychedelic trip out of it, it would be, it might be an ideal drug for mood and anxiety symptoms. And you see, this is all very anecdotal and not, uh, demonstrated in controlled fashion, but there are there are so many thousands of people that are microdosing these drugs to treat mood and anxiety symptoms. Uh, you know, and, and also they seem to enhance creativity and mental flexibility uh, for people. So, um, so what we wanted to do then was to develop uh, a drug that these drugs hit what's you know called the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor that hits this receptor, but does so in a way where it, it sort of has a ceiling effect. So, so even if you take a lot of it, it's not going to be very psychedelic, you know, be minimally psychedelic, even if someone takes more of it than they're prescribed. So we wanted to create, a, and, 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 and what, it wasn't clear how you would do that exactly, but this was again, an example where there were case reports of people making new psychedelic drugs where they weren't all that psychedelic. And you can test this to some degree in rodents by the, 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 their heads twitch when they're having when they're tripping. They they have this sort of characteristic, very fast twitching of their head and ears. And so, uh, so we could, we, so we could, we, so we would saw, see, we saw these reports, and we were able to bring those molecules now into the lab and start to look at them and see what do do the rodent head twitch experiments confirm what these people are saying uh, from their anecdotal human use that this drug is not, doesn't have a strong psychedelic effect, but, and then the second question becomes, well, maybe that just means it doesn't do a damn thing. Uh, so we wanted to also sh show that it, even though it's not, doesn't have powerful uh, psychedelic effects, it's still antidepressant. So we were able to then take that into like stress models and such in rodents and show that it it retained the antidepressant effect. But how how I mean, 
I, one question I'm curious how to, how do you model that in rodents uh, antidepressant how can you how can you how can you measure that are, are rodents depressive and uh, yeah, yeah, well, the, 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 there's no perfect way and the models are are not ideal and in fact Gilgamesh is is working on in its platform of creating better methodology there but there's enough there you know the sort of the gold standard would be that you take rodents and you stress them for a few weeks mm -hmm. uh, and, and mild, mild stress, you know, the, the, the bedding's wet or their, the light cycle is, is, is not right for them, you know, light, light, dark cycle. Um, so you can stress them. And then when you stress them, they stop drinking sugar water as much. So that's like a sort of an, a model of what's called anhedonia in humans or, or lack of, you know, sort of, In, in, in impaired uh, pleasure response, you know. Uh, uh, so, so you can measure this in rodents, and um, and so what you're able to see is when you stress these animals chronically for a few weeks, they stop drinking uh, sweet stuff that, that they like. They they reduce the amount of, of of sugar water they drink, and you can show then that with antidepressants it reverses this. Mm -hmm. So, so you can you can show that it it it, it protects them against this stress induced um, uh, uh, anhedonia. Um, so, um, so we were able to show then with we we're, we've been able to show them with that we're able to make molecules that are not that psychedelic, but still look like. Of course, you still have to prove that in in humans, obviously, but that looks like it preserves. The antidepressant response, but without the psychedelic. So, if that's the case, if that works, then you have a drug that you know you can go to your uh, local pharmacy and you know pick up a prescription for, and the risks of of that you know being used at home are are, are mild. But we'd still probably want to have some sort of psychotherapy with it. Um, but but it make it really becomes a very different you know becomes much more universally available for treating these conditions. This would, um, be a, would be a great thing. This would be a great thing to have more of that on the yeah, market. So that's another example of what Gilgamesh is working on. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're talking to some of our pharma peers that are interested in what we're doing in this respect. Um, so who knows, at some point, we might partner with people on it, on some of these things. Um, and, then, and then, you know, the other example from our, you know, core portfolio is that there's a very interesting molecule called ibogaine. And, uh, and ibogaine is, uh, uh, is a compound that comes from a, um, uh, a, a, a bush in Africa and in, pl in places like Gabon that's used for initiation rituals. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very powerful psychedelic drug. that's uh, very long lasting. And it's also dangerous uh, because it can cause uh, cardiac rhythm abnormalities. It, it has a QTC prolongation effect. So there are people that have died from uh, uh, from taking ibogaine. Uh, but uh, a uh, some heroin addict in New York um, uh, was given some of this, uh, you know, many uh, decades ago, and he was surprised to find that his uh, craving for heroin completely disappeared. Really? Yeah. And so um, this then, this observation led to a tremendous interest and, and the FDA was involved and the NIDA, the NIH was involved and they were going to develop it. Um, but because it, you know, the, you know, as you know, the politics of psychedelic drugs was that the, they're all terrible, you know, uh, this is your mind on drugs, you know, uh, and, you um, And so, uh, so, uh, and because also they had this cardiac toxicity risk, uh, this was, they were unable to, uh, to, to develop this, but it was so clearly, uh, there were so many clear anecdotes of, of Ibogaine being um, extremely powerful in one dose to treat heroin addiction or opiate addiction, that clinics sprung up in other countries Like in, like in Mexico, 
to treat people, you know, sort of the, the rich and famous go to, you know, these Ibogaine clinics and mm-hmm. can do it and such, you know. And so, uh, but nothing then really happened with it because it's now a generic drug and it's not that safe and this sort of thing. Um, and, uh, but actually a Thai now is developing Ibogaine and or Ibogaine is uh, one of their programs. They have many, many programs. And, um, but what, and, 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 but this is another example of what Gilgamesh is doing is we were like, there's no way in hell we're going to develop a generic drug. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's too expensive it, and, and, and especially a generic drug that's has safety issues. Um, and so what we did was uh, that, uh, that the, uh, the, the, the labs at Columbia university, which, you know, we're, you know, kind of, uh, uh, partnering with had spent a decade working on ibogaine uh, chemistry and they had you know meticulously changed one atom after another and looked at how the pharmacology morphed um, with these changes and uh, and they were able to find molecules that had very that were similar to ibogaine but were tweaked or tuned in terms of in this case, for example, being more uh, kappa opiate opiate, uh, antagonist activity, but but that's not abuse. Kappa doesn't cause abuse. Um, And so they uh, they realized these drugs were very powerful and they were novel molecules. And what we've been uh, finding now, and this was not intelligent design, this was just stupid luck, was that um, some of these molecules, that cardiac abnormality, that cardiac risk was tuned out inadvertently. So they were safer and they were, they looked at least as effective as, as, as Ibogaine. Um, so, so, so Gilgamesh is now moving forward with developing novel analogs of Ibogaine that have this better, uh, therapeutic index. Uh, Did I understand you right? So Gilgamesh mission and vision is to take uh, drugs from the psychedelic space, look at what works already and uh, make the existing uh, approaches in drugs much better. So safer and more effective on the chemist bench. Is that the right uh, perception? That's, that's, that's how we started. We're, we're not, some of them are not exact, you know, and for example, ketamine is, a, it, it's not, Cla- classically, it's not a psychedelic drug. It's it's not. They're not five HT two A agonists. Um, so uh, ibogaine is an atypical uh, psychedelic, and we're we're not we're not wed to things being you know s- psychedelic or, or, or drugs necessarily. But we we realize that this particular area, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 where, for example, the five HT two A receptor, the NMDA receptor, these were uh, uh, the cap, cap opioid uh, receptors. These were areas that were ripe for innovation, but we're not. Uh, we, we, we'll, we'll, we, and we thought that these drug using these targets was safer um, as a starting point because there's already essentially, uh, um, you know, precedent uh, for their precedented targets um, in humans, and so we thought that these drugs will be rapidly effective, powerful drugs that will be, and if we can make them innovate, innovate on them, uh, it's a great starting point, but in the future, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll broaden, broaden that out. But most of the things we're going to be doing will be around these particular targets, uh, at this point. And, you know, where we go, I mean, you know, that's part of the problem, you know, back to your question about like why, you know, with big pharma, is that you know sometimes big pharma did great things in the sense that they were very innovative, and they would go after targets that were uh, completely you know where there was really very little information you know and 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 they weren't they certainly weren't like in the old days trying their own drugs uh, you know so you know but back in the old days you know uh, when the benzodiazepines were you know created Sternberg would you know make ben- the first benzos and try it with a soup spoon and uh, tell his wife he won't be home, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, that didn't happen. So, so there were a lot of these programs in big pharma that just in theory, you know, were interesting, but 
their chances, their probabilities of technical success were small. And we think that in this case, you know, starting with precedented targets, our probability of success is much, you know, much, much larger. So, so we think that that's the, we think that innovating around these areas is the, is the, you know, kind of the best starting point for the company. So this gives you basically then a <clears throat> composition of meta patents in, in this area. I mean, if you remodel the molecules, right. We, we have we, very, right. very strong patent base. Yeah. We, we're, we're, we're basically our philosophy, you know, it's, it's a, it's a uh, somewhat fraught, you know, uh, kind of crowded IP space, but what we've been able to do is to, sh is to show on you know, very unexpected results, mm -hmm. uh, Or these molecules that you know no one skilled in the art would be able to predict, and that's been you know s successful for us. We have for the you know for example for our first two our lead two lead programs we uh, you know we, we've already uh, you know um, uh, you know have been successful in in uh, getting uh, the first two uh, patents uh, uh, you know now you know getting near to be issued and you know. So, so those that that's worked out uh, perfectly well for us for the first two, and we expect that'll be the ibogaine ones are even easier. Um, so, but yeah, so we're, we're we're that's probably one of the big uh, biggest things with Gilgamesh is we're very good with IP. We're very good with uh, unknowing, understanding a very complex uh, intellectual property space. And compared to Perception, your first company, I mean, you said it's a one product company, basically. It's been a one product company purchased by Thai Life Science. Now Gilgamesh uh, has a pipeline. So you're building a pipeline and the vision, I believe, is uh, creating a lasting company with Gilgamesh. Is this the right perception? Uh, yeah, we, 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 you know, we expect to do partnering and licensing deals. Uh, we think that we'll have more substrate than we can actually prosecute ourselves. So we think that there'll be, um, and you know, there'll be a demand for from companies that need pipeline to to work with us. But yes, we want to build not only this machine to the future of the space vis-a-vis -vis, uh, chemistry, uh, which we're I think we're doing a tremendously good job of. But but also then we're 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 putting a small amount of our effort into a uh, platform that is uh, essentially saying like. Well, you know, the big, the elephant in the room with psychiatry is that you're developing drugs and however good your drugs are, the disorders are not um, carved at, at the at biological joints. They're sort of, you know, sort of, you know, you, you, you're, you can meet the definition of depression, you know, umpteen ways, uh, and, you know, and, and so you're, It's depression, but you, you may have very few symptoms in common with somebody else that has the same uh, uh, disorder uh, 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 syndrome. So that 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 really creates a lot of challenges uh, for drug development. If you know you, you, you you're trying to make chemicals to target a target, but the disorder is not you know connected necessarily to that particular any particular biology but as a description so so that 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 that's been one of the big big challenges in psychiatry and so what we're trying to do at Gilgamesh is to create a platform that will begin to allow us to have um, biomarkers vis-a-vis -vis, for example um, electrophysiology so we do a lot with EEG uh, signals um, mm -hmm. and we have in-house uh, uh, capabilities in that regard um, and uh, we do that in people and we do that in rodents and we use neuropixels and rodents so we can, you know, uh, interrogate the electrophysiology of individual neurons across the neural axis. And so we're, we're, um, we're, we're trying to create a, a better scientific capability to do all of this stuff um, than head twitches in rodents, which has, you know, been around for, you know, or throwing, throwing them in a tank of water to see how long they swim, you know, it sounds very almost medieval. Uh, so we, we think that, 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 that's sort of the, will also be, I think if we're successful, be part of the special sauce of the company in the future is it has this sort of ability to do, you know, we, we do a lot of machine learning of rodent behavior and a lot of machine learning and, and electrophysiology work. Um, you know, we'll start to, you know, look at, uh, 
natural voice recordings and such in humans, most likely in the near future in, in patients. Uh, so there'll be a, uh, you know, that'll also be machine learned. So we'll, 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 we'll start to create a way to, in, you know, as a goal to be able to predict what drug a, a particular individual should get based on their history, their biology, um, and, uh, and such. And their, you know, their, their, um, and their behavior. Um, so let's stay a little bit with the machine learning. Um, do you have an in-house department, or do, uh, do you partner yeah. up with? Yeah, it's it's we're doing both. We have in we have an in-house uh, uh, data science that that uh, uh, has a lot of expertise, and we we and we then we partner. Uh, we have. Uh, Uh, we have embedded it at, at Harvard at uh, Bob Data's lab, um, folks uh, uh, helping us with um, running experiments as we speak um, uh, with machine learning of rodent behavior. And uh, uh, Bob's one of the world experts in this. And then at, at NYU, um, at Andre Fenton's lab at NYU, we also have our own like small lab uh, kind of inside his lab uh, that's doing a lot of the electrophysiology work. And we have some, another lab in England uh, that's our, uh, the sister lab, the electrophysiology. So, so we have a, a few sort of boutique, uh, you know, most of what we do at this point is, you know, working with CROs around the world, you know, for efficiency, but we have a few sort of boutique uh, operations that are, um, you know, ex exploring this, uh, you know, kind of this, this, uh, Uh, you know, trying to create this sort of uh, platform capability. You put an amazing experience to expertise together with your team. I mean, you have uh, the chemistry, you have the early stage drug discovery, drug development expertise, you have the clinical development expertise, uh, the biology, uh, an understanding of uh, psychology, psychiatry from the practical point of view, so from the patient point of view. And then now you start integrating also machine learning, artificial intelligence, and you really create a nice engine. Sounds to me like that. Yeah, no, I, I, I look, I, I think there's been a lot, there's been a lot of people. I mean, I think what I'm particularly good at is just identifying the people and trends to put together that will make things happen. So for example, on the machine learning and side and electrophysiology side, my, my friend and colleague Amit Etkin, uh, you know, started a company, um, uh, Alto out in, uh, and he's a professor at, uh, at Stanford and, and he created this company uh, that's all built around uh, bio electrophysiology and other biomarkers uh, for prediction. So I was very influenced by him and he went off and did his own thing and consults a little bit to us, but, but, I, but it was like, you know, that's where I want to go. And that's, that's also where companies, you know, other companies in the space, in, in the psychedelic space really have limited capabilities that they, they may, partner with people, they may bring people in, but they're not built at core to be innovators. They're more sort of let's, let's buy up a bunch of different companies or let's, you know, push, you know, MDMA through this through, through to approval, but they're not built around, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of ability uh, to, to, to do the science, um, um, you know, that, and that, that's kind of where we're, I think, you know, a little bit different than most of our competitors, you know? So, um, you know, with, with a couple of exceptions, that's, that's, I think what makes us, uh, you know, a, a different kind of company uh, is that we're sort of, you know, we're, we're, we're focused on moving things fast in the clinic, but we're not, that's not the only, the only thing we're, we're doing. And it's, 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 and it's all pretty much, you know, under one roof. Innovation is challenging. I completely agree to that. Um, let me ask you one question. When I look at the, the article, uh, which is titled with the Harvard scientists acting as a highest treasure trove launches a new psychedelics firm focused on drug analogs. Um, analogs. Um, I did work, I worked in antibiotics. Uh, it's about 15, 16 years ago. And then back in 2006, uh, the market, the investment market was good for antibiotics, but then it really went southwards and went down. Vaccine was the next space I, was, uh, I did work with. Um, and uh, I was raising funds for companies in 2013, 14, and 15, which was basically next to impossible. Nobody was interested in uh, 
putting anything on the market against viral diseases. And uh, this changed with the pandemic, obviously, and uh, it became a lot easier. Uh, I never worked with um, companies in your field. So I'm really curious. I read in the article that Gilgamesh Pharmaceutical completed that 27 million Series A. It was the article that's uh, May 6, 2021. Um, how is the investment space? How are, invest are investors aware of this great opportunity? Or uh, is it still early so that there is uh, some work yeah. that needs to be done on the investment side? Well, there's definitely work to be done. I mean, this was a very super hot space, um, uh, you know, sort of psychedelics, longevity things, you know, there were all these sort of hot, you know, areas that, you know, the Christian Angermeyer was in every one of, uh, and, um, and Bitcoin and Bitcoin. So. And Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. And they often put together the same people are interested in all, all, all those three things, you know? And, um, so, uh, it, it's been, it was very hot. And then of course, you know, the, uh, as you you know know better than me, the whole you know biotech sector has been you know pretty much slammed uh, 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 in, in in recent times, and um, and I think uh, that uh, that's now had a some somewhat chilling effect on I think uh, uh, the whole space, and I think you know we're sort of in a little bit of a lucky position um, you know because we think that you know we've we we raised. You know our Series A. Um, we're we're um, we're now uh, you know uh, got, you know we're we're now sort of doing pretty well. Uh, you know even beyond that. So we we're, we're we're right now very well funded. You know to sort of uh, weather the you know the sort of uh, uh, you know winter uh, uh, in the space. So uh, we think that right now you know we have. We'll, you know, we're, we, we, we're, we're, it's pretty clear we'll have enough money to run multiple programs into, into human data, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and build out what we need to build out. And so, you know, um, and then data will rule, you know, so I think if the data looks good, um, then, uh, you know, and hopefully in a, a year or two, uh, you know, it's, it's all, you know, kind of somewhat, uh, trends, uh, you know, the biotech space will sort of recover somewhat from, you know, some an extreme. So I, I yes, yeah, so I think that, but uh, I, I think that despite that, um, there's still a tremendous interest in this space. I mean, you know, uh, I, no matter where I, I, I'm always still surprised, no matter where I go, putting aside investors, just the population is pretty well versed around this whole psychedelic revolution. People are interested, people are trying it, um, you know, especially in the, probably on the, you know, coasts like in New York and California. Um, so, um, so I think that that, that will continue and build, uh, you know, the press has been, you know, uh, you know, back in the, in the, in the old days, the press was, you know, you know, drugs will kill you, every, you know, uh, any, uh, uh, you know, psychedelics are terrible. And now, you know, they, they can't write enough excite articles about how exciting the space is. So I think that's helping. I think what's, you know, limited still is, you know, the, you know, big pharma, um, some of the, you know, the, 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 the you know, larger institutional, uh, you know, venture capital kinds of folks are still sort of watching this carefully. But, you know, with a few exceptions, like Atsuka, you know, most of these pharma companies are still sort of, on the sidelines, sort of watching what's happening, but it's very clear they understand the potential of these things. It's just that you know they tend to be, they tend to you know. What they, I'm, I'm curious, what is hold in your opinion? What is holding the traditional life science VCs back? Um, I mean, when I think about oncology, for example, oncology is a no-brainer. You can put any oncology project on VC's table, and as long as they are doing something novel and innovative, which is quite normal in that space, um, they step in. I think it's also pharma. What is the reason that you say that uh, the VCs or the life science VCs are aware of the opportunity, but not really willing currently to step in? I, I, I think you, you may have ideas about it too, but I think that part of it is that they're looking at whether big pharma or pharma in general is you know, sort of buying into this because in some ways they're the customer, right? You know, mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think that uh, big pharma uh, is still, uh, you know, looking to see, you know, what is the business model here for these things? Um, how well do they actually work in trials? Um, you know, they they they're 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 being you know cautious about about it, um, and um, and and they want to sort of you know just just as Pfizer was not the first statin, you know, uh, they, 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 you know they're waiting around, and and some of it's also that some of these early, first level compounds they lack. Uh, innovation, they lack IP. So, you know, none of these companies is going to buy uh, a drug with no IP. That makes no sense at all. Um, so I think that there, and there, and with, with a company like us, we're just entering the clinic um, in the fourth quarter. So that's, you know, so, uh, so I, I'd expect that, you know, a year from now or so, uh, that, you know, there'll be very interesting conversations going on if we're successful. Um, and so, but when I understand your approach, you're creating drugs with novel IP, with a very strong uh, patent protection, and then you bring that to the market. I understand, for example, I mean, I had a conversation last, um, it was in October last year, in, uh, with, with a researcher in the longevity space, and there I had really difficulties to say, okay, how does a drug look like? And he said, okay, there is no drug, so it's basically... Uh, just change your habits, change your lifestyle. And this is really hard to sell to VCs to put money into a company that at the end of the day, don't create novel IP and they don't create something, a product. Uh, right. As far as I understand your description also with some existing approaches on the market, it's basically um, going into the generic space, repurposing drugs, but um, not with very strong IP protection. And Gilgamesh changes that. So your approach is clearly to... Uh, go down the track development route. Well, yeah, and, and what we expect is that these other, the, the fact, because there's been a lot of sort of excitement, Christian Engermeyers and Peter Thiels and these people who have been funding, uh, Mike Novogratz, a lot of these people that have been funding the space, um, it's been very valuable because, you know, by the time we and, and Jane Jay with Spravato, that they're building out the market, they'll build out some of the infrastructure for these things. Um, so, but they're doing it with molecules, including J and J, that have you know limited or you know weak intellectual property, which you know just goes to show you how much you know desperation there is for molecules. Is that J and J was willing to develop an, a non-patentable molecule? Uh, you know, esketamine obviously has been around for 50 years or something, right? So, um, <clears throat> so, so, so this, 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 uh, you know, is, 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 you know, I think was very surprising, uh, but it, it speaks to, you know, the, the level of demand, but yeah, I think that that's what, that's, what's going to happen is that, is that as these things are shown to be effective and, um, and uh, you know, the compasses of the world and a tie and, uh, and maps and uh, whoever else, uh, you know, puts effort into this space, it, it, it all is, you know, I think a, a wind at our back. Um, and, you know, at this point also, we're very happy that we're a uh, kind of, you know, thriving private company. Um, and right now not, you know, not having to, you know, be looking at stock prices. This is always a good thing. I think currently the stock market is uh, in unknown territory. I would, uh, would flash it that way. Um, do you see uh, some disruptions in your area? I mean, um, uh, or is it business as usual? Is there any in the United States in, in, uh, on the East Coast? Is there nervosity on the market or is there uh, any fear on the market, in your opinion, uh, when it comes to funding in your area? I, I, I think that funding has dried up, um, you know, we, we just kind of have been just in time to, you know, kind of make sure we're, we're, we're pretty well funded. Um, but it, it, the mar I think a lot of these markets have dried up to a large degree. Um, and, um, and so that will be interesting to see what happens because, you know, when, everybody was excited about this stuff to the extent that almost anything could get funded. You have just a lot of, you know, 
dubious things, uh, people throwing a lot of money at a lot of dubious things. And so I think what we're starting to see is, you know, a lot of those things are, are you know, will not be able to raise money and will fold. And, but some of them are so dubious, there's not much for us to do about it. It's not like, oh, that's a great project. Why don't we buy it? You know, uh, there's not that many things that seem all that valuable, but maybe there'll be one or two. But, um, but we think that that's what's going to happen now. So there's going to be a you know, considerable consolidation and, you know, it'll be a tie and Gilgamesh and, uh, uh, and, you know, maybe one or two other names that all uh, you know, will you know will remain the you know sort of doing the the bulk of the work. Now I think um, you're absolutely right that the market is a little bit in a turnaround situation. What's uh, interesting to me is that uh, when I remember the last two crises, one was in 2000, and the other one in 2008, there was much more fear on the market. What at, at the moment what I miss is this this fear moment. So. It was amazing the last three to four or five years. You were, uh, you were mentioning some names. I mean, they invested in Bitcoin, they invested in uh, longevity in the psychedelic space, and did a lot of groundbreaking work. And with that came a huge push also on the public market. I just, I just think about um, Kathy Wood, for example, with her investment approach. Then in the tech sector, there was a market correction. Many public companies corrected the between 50 to 90 percent and this also has ripple effects on the private market but what i miss still is this are these fear moments so that people are really fearful and uh, pulling money out and uh, also from other sectors this has not happened yet what's your opinion on the market development when it comes to investments in the coming one or two years in general general economy I'm not a, a macroeconomic expert, so uh, I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. But um, I mean, I, you know, the you you certainly get the feeling like you know the, the stuff pushed at me is that you know we're entering you know a period where things are going to be you know. Uh, there's going to be more fear and more discounts over the next couple of years, uh, and um, and that uh, you know uh, you should you know batten down the hatches, you know. So uh, uh, so we you know that's that's the the word on the street now. What exactly what happens? I think you know is 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 uh, you know uh, and not an entirely clear, but you would just think that we this is one of those times where tremendous amounts of money were flowing into everything from everywhere, including the government. Um, and when that music stops, you know, uh, you know, you know, you, you, you tend to, to see some, some big problems uh, arise and, uh, and a lot of strain. So I think that, uh, you know, uh, but on the other hand, you know, uh, I think that the, the, the biotech sector was already sort of in correction for mm -hmm. quite a while now. So if you think about it, it, it like I'm guessing, and you, you may know better than me that, you know, the, those sorts of cycles will typically last for, you know, one, two, th two, three years, something like that. And, um, at, at, you know, at most. And so, you know, I think we may be at least for biotech sort of half halfway or so through that cycle. Um, but it's hard to know. When I look at the challenges in fundraising in 2008, I think the companies that are following your approach, that you create solid IP, that you are innovative, there is always market, uh, there's always capital on the market for such companies. Yeah, that's what we expect. So we're, we're trying to take all of the, you know, doom and gloom, uh, you know, uh, messages I get with a grain of salt that, you know, we if we create some strong products that actually are an answer to some of the mental health problems that exist um, and, and, and that are really, you know, differentiated, that we should be able to, you know, there should be capital uh, that will uh, flow into that uh, almost in any kind of market. I mean, when you look at the statistics, there is, uh, this, this is termed dry powder, 
there is enough capital in, in VCs. So they were quite successful in fundraising. Um, the difficulties that I see are companies that are not really innovative, but it's in all sectors currently. So that uh, the Me Too products, for example, where, where people just see, okay, uh, 10 companies are doing something novel and I'm the 11th or 12th company. And then the other ones, uh, which is also something that helps failing is when the product development doesn't move forward. So when they are just stuck in the discovery stage or in the preclinical stage, and there is no progress in the product pipeline. But I think as long as the company creates IP and uh, holds the team together and moves the lead candidates forward into the clinical development area, I think there is there's no there's not much to worry about. Yeah, I mean, I th I, I I think uh, uh, we're we're right now, you know, sort of all eyes are focused on you know uh, this coming year's data data readouts and and uh, and building building the you know building the uh, our, our capability to run these trials and uh, you know kind of pretty excited about you know pretty much every month there's some innovation that's going on in the chemistry space. Um, sometimes I don't even know what's happening. There's so much going on. So I think it's, you know, it, I, I'm encouraged that, and, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm rooting, you know, I, having started perception, I'm, I'm rooting for the Atai people too. Uh, but I think that, you know, there's, there's going to be, uh, you know, room for, uh, for, for a few good companies in the space. Jonathan, it's amazing listening to you, and I learned a lot about psychedelic drug development. We have five minutes left. You said that you need uh, to run off in uh, at eleven o'clock. You have the next meeting. Let yeah. me ask. Let me ask you one one final question. Uh, we were talking about fundraising. Uh, is Gilgamesh open currently? Uh, to talk to investors. So there are some investors in the audience. Uh, if someone gets interested, can they reach you? Are you open for investment or uh, are you waiting for your clinical data and then start the next round of financing? Yeah, um, we're. I, I think there's a small window that uh, right now if people are are were you know interested in uh, investing in Gilgamesh that, that they should they can contact us and we can we can explain to them where we're at with that. So there's some there's some there's some optionality, uh, uh, you know, in the in the very near future. What's the best way to reach out to Gilgamesh? Is it directly to you via LinkedIn, or uh, do you have an email address that uh, people? Should yeah, yeah. So, so certainly, I'm on LinkedIn, and I check that uh, periodically. And then uh, they can, uh, you know, also uh, directly reach out to me as fine, which is uh, John J O N at Gilgamesh Pharmaceutical, not not plural, but singular. Uh, uh, com. Uh, John at Gilgamesh Pharmaceutical.com. If you don't mind, I would add it to the description of the podcast so that when someone is interested, they can directly totally. connect you. Um, did, 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 did I miss something? Do we want to add something at the end of the podcast? Is there a topic, a question open that you would like me to ask? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think we've covered a lot of material. Um, and um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, uh, um, I, I, I think that one of the interesting things about this space is that, you know, for people that have never uh, experienced these sorts of drugs, it's almost uh, ineffable. It's really hard to almost describe the the, uh, the, the the sort of the the, the kind of uh, you know so the word psychedelic means mind manifesting you know the sort of uh, way in which these things are sort of a way uh, a way into um, you know understanding human consciousness and understanding uh, some of the challenges that that people have so um, so I think uh, you know I'd in, encourage people to you know uh, um, to, to read about it and, and to, you know, uh, and, uh, to, uh, be, uh, uh, to, you know, sort of to, so look at this, uh, what looks like a, um, you know, a, a true revolution in, in, in psychiatry, you know, that, uh, that this, this is going to happen now. And, uh, who, who ends up winning the, the, the race and such as, you know, anyone's, guess at this point, but we think that, you know, Gilgamesh probably has a good, a good shot at, 
uh, at, at being uh, a major player in the space. And, you know, when we look back now, you know, a few years from now. So, no, I, I think there's no particular uh, uh, other uh, uh, questions. I think, you know, we've covered some of the issues around how these uh, drugs uh, have this w way of, um, of changing uh, the brain of, of causing neuroplasticity and that, you know, th this is, it's interesting because it's a very unusual experience uh, uh, or for psychiatrists because the drugs are both enhancing people's ability to have insight about themselves. And at the same time, they're having sort of direct biological effects. So, uh, so I think, and, you know, even if they, th 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 there's a way in which those things probably go together in a certain way, but there's a psychological or sort of software experience of, of these things. And then there's this a sort of hardware, you know, effect on, uh, on the actual um, synaptic um, and, and circuitry uh, of the brain uh, that, that these things are sort of changing. And, and, um, and, uh, the, and so I think it's a very interesting time right now for us because of that fact that, you know, those are sort of a little bit like, you know, lights a, a particle in a wave, you know, it's sort of like they're, they're, they're working through psychological mechanisms, but they're also working through, you know, uh, second messenger signaling cascades uh, uh, and, uh, and changes in, um, in the complexity of neurocircuitry that you can read out in neuroimaging uh, experiments and such. So I, I, I think that uh, we've covered most of the, most of the, uh, excitement here. And I think, um, uh, you know, I'd be more than happy to, to, uh, chat with folks who, if they're, if they're interested in hearing more. And I completely agree to what you say that, uh, there is a huge need in society for your products and for your developments. And I'm looking forward to hear more from your team and, uh, the clinical results then I think next year when they, when they are available and maybe we do another episode when you see how the drug works, then, in the clinic center, what the results are and what the next steps are of the company. Yeah, well, thanks. For this. It's been a great uh, pleasure and and, uh, and and very enjoyable. So I'll I'll, I'll look forward to uh, uh, our, our our next podcast episode. Thank you very much for your time, Jonathan, and all the best and good luck for your team. Have a great